Well, in this second part of our video for Lesson 2-1, we're going to be looking at how to determine if, well, first off, how to find the domain and range by looking at a graph. And then we're going to look at um, how to determine whether or not a graph is a function, and we're going to be looking at function notation. So here it says a rule for the function graph to the right is y equals 2 to the x power minus 4. And they ask us to find the domain and range of, a function, of the function. Now personally, I like finding the domain by looking at the equation. I think it's an easier way because sometimes we're going to look at some graphs where maybe finding the domain can be really tricky. So I like to look at the, the equation to determine the domain. So here, let's look at this equation, y equals 2 to the x power minus 4. So what I do is I run through some of the key numbers and ask if it's possible for those numbers to work. And so here we have a variable that's an exponent. So I need to ask myself, is it okay to have 0 that's an exponent? Yeah, I can have 0 as an exponent. Can I have a negative exponent? Yes, we've worked with negatives that were exponents in advanced algebra. Can you have an exponent that's a fraction? Yes, we can have fractions that are exponents. We can have fraction, uh, decimals that are exponents. Any number that I can think of, I can put in there for x as an exponent. So what that means for my domain is my domain is going to be all real numbers. Now I could write that out in words, but remember we just learned those symbols. And remember our symbol for all real numbers looks something like that. So we can say that that is our domain, is all real numbers. Now to find the range, we would definitely want to look at the graph. So if you're not given a graph, you either want to sketch it out or think about what the graph would look like or graph it on your calculator. But here they gave us the graph. So let's look at the graph for a second. Now, recall we've already talked in the past about asymptotes. That's what's going on here. This is what we would call an asymptote at, at where y is negative 4. Because what that means is that blue line is going to get really, really, really close to that red line, but it's not actually going to ever touch it. The reason why is we're never going to have an answer of negative 4 for y. Because if you look at your equation, there's nothing I could put in for x that would get rid of the 2. You might think, well, what about 0? Well, 2 to the 0 power is 1. It's not 0. There's no exponent I could apply to 2 to get exactly 0. I could make it really, really small to be a really small decimal, but not ever 0. So y is never going to be negative 4. But you can see from the graph that it, from negative 4, it goes infinitely up. So it can be any number above negative 4. So the way that we describe that is y is greater than negative 4. We would not say greater than or equal to negative 4 because just like I said, it's never going to be exactly equal to negative 4. So just be y is greater than negative 4. So let's look at the other one. Here we have the equation y equals 3 times x minus 5 quantity squared minus 1. So again, we don't have a graph, but for this one we could find our domain by just looking at the equation. And you can see that you can put anything you want in for x. So my domain would be all real numbers. But let's figure out what the range would be. So for the range, we're going to want to look at the graph. So let's get out your calculator. And we're going to create a graph for that equation. So again, the equation that we're graphing is going to be 3. And then in parentheses, x minus 5 squared. And then it's going to be minus 1. Hit enter, and here's your graph. So we can see that it starts, our y value starts here where y is negative 1, and then it goes infinitely up. But here it includes negative 1, so we could have a value for y that would be negative 1. Let's go back to our notes. And the way that we would get negative 1 is if x were 5, 5 minus 5 is 0, 0 squared is 0, times 3 is 0. So we could get exactly negative 1 as our answer. So my range here would be y is greater than or equal to negative 1 because, again, negative 1 is included. Let's talk now about the vertical line test. Sometimes we're going to be looking at graphs and we want to determine if they're functions or not. So the way that we do that is what's called the vertical line test. Basically, all that means is that we're going to draw a vertical line. And if anywhere on that graph, if that vertical line touches that graph at only one point, it is a function like the graph on the left here. But the graph on the right, if I draw a vertical line there, you can clearly see that it's going to go through two points, so the graph on the right is not a function. Now, if it is a function, there's a special way that we write it, using function notation. Now, we could use, when we, when we refer to things using function notation, we name the function any single letter that we want. Now, the most common ones are F or G. Sometimes they'll also use H. 
Or if we're dealing with a story problem, dealing with a car's speed, for example, maybe you use C for the name of the function. Or if we're dealing with temperature, maybe use T for, the, for temperature for the name of your function. But when we write it in function notation, we see this, f of x, and that's how we read it. When you see that f and then parentheses x, you read it as f of x. Now, what's in parentheses? We call that the argument. Now, I'm not used to calling it argument. In the past, I've always seen it referred to as the input. So personally, I prefer to use the word input uh, over the word argument. Maybe it's just because I like to avoid confrontation. I'm sorry, lame joke. Uh, but anyhow, uh, the idea here is that whatever's in parentheses, that identifies the independent variable. It's very important. Whatever is in parentheses in function notation identifies for us the independent variable. Now that whole chunk, f of x, that represents the value of the function or the output of the function. So let's look at some situations involving function notation. By the way, we're not going to do this on the CAS. There's a way to just plug it in and uh, have the CAS do a bunch of stuff for you. But here we're just going to use our calculators just as normal calculators. Um, so we're going to evaluate. Now that's another word to be familiar with, evaluate. Evaluate, all that means is that if you see that phrase, it just means we're going to plug in a number, put it in your equation, and get an answer. It's a lot easier just to say evaluate. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to evaluate this function for f of 5, meaning my input is going to be 5. So I'm going to put 5 in for x. So we're just going to type this in on our calculator exactly as we see it. So if we go to a calculator screen, we're going to type in 4 times 1 half. So we'll do 1 divided by 2 in parentheses. To change the exponent to 5, we do this little caret button. It looks like an arrow pointing up in the air. And type in 5, hit enter. We get 0.125, or maybe your calculator left it as a fraction as 1 eighth. So that's your answer. There's a good question. Does f of negative 2 plus 3, is that the same as f of negative 2 plus f of 3? Well, I don't know. Let's find out. Well, first, what's in parentheses here? f of negative 2 plus 3 means I can simplify that to be f of 1. So this we could do without our calculator because we're just going to take 4 times 1 half to the first power. Well, 1 half to the first power is 1 half, and half of 4 is 2. So I want to see, well, would f of negative 2 plus f of 3, would that equal 2? So let's start with f of negative 2. When I put negative 2 in my function, it's going to be 4 times 1 half to the negative second power. Well, when you do that in your calculator, you end up getting 16. Things aren't looking good right now, because in order for me to get add something to 16, it's got to be a negative number, and I don't think that's going to happen here. Let's find out. f of 3 equals 4 times 1 half cubed, and surely that's not going to be a negative number. It ends up just being, whoops, ends up just being 1 half, or 0.5. And if I add 16 and 1 half together, I get 16 and a half, or 16.5. I don't get 2. So these are not equal to each other. And that would be your answer. Um, and to evaluate, to do this last one, f of q plus 1, what we're going to do is we're going to put q plus 1. That's going to be my input value. I'm going to put that in for x. So I would just write this as 4 times 1 half, and then q plus 1 is my exponent. And there's nothing I can do to simplify that, so that would be my answer. Now, however, you might say, well, can't I multiply the 4 times the 1 half and get 2 and have 2 to the q plus 1? Mm, that would be wrong. It's a, that's a great question. It's a great thought. However, you got to remember order of operations. Order of operations tells us before we can do any multiplying, you first have to take care of the exponent. So since I can't do anything with the exponent, I can't do anything more to simplify this problem. So I'm, stu I'm stuck. So that's going to be my final answer. So... We're going to stop there. If you want to try this one on your own, you can do that. But otherwise, it's just like the one we just did. So we're going to stop the video here. Um, so now you should be able to do all the problems in your assignment. So with that, good luck.